No, 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 keep it going. We'll cut out some stuff. But I think I'm we saying. should just, I think we should now act as this as the cold open and kind of just go from. Oh, there. shit. We've been recording this whole time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think this, this could be a good, uh, this could be the cold open. Okay. And we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll rip through everything else. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying we just keep talking right now? This is the open. Yes. Okay. This is the so podcast. Reintroduce. Yeah, so this is the Driveline uh, R&D podcast. Uh, more Fish IPA. The Driveline Research and Drinks podcast. Uh, could be subject to change, maybe. Um, still working on it. Uh, we are three guys in our mid-20s that work in the R&D department at Driveline Baseball. Do some research. Not the only uh, thing we work. Tech stuff, all of that. Um uh, and yeah, we're just, uh, this is a podcast to kind of like talk about some of the stuff we do, some of the things we talk about. Who are we? Well, first we have Kyle Lindley. No, we're restarting because that shit was way too, no, for real, we got to keep it more snappy. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. We have to do yeah. daddy first. No, 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 no. I'm saying we're ripping through everyone. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We got Kyle Lindley. Biomechanics sensor research. Uh, also basically the leading, um, the leading Aficionado. guy. Aficionado. Of oh. gaze tracking, yeah. I mean, well, I, I you mean, don't have a, you don't have a paper. I was, was saying lackey. I think I was going to use the term lackey. <laughs> it's a it's an equal share of gaze research. I mean, you know, he, he's here and like you know someone else is here. Okay, and, <laughs> sure. and then the moon's over there and there's people on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gaze tracking research, yeah. So Kyle uh, graduated from Arizona State, mm-hmm. forks up, yep. biomedical engineering, yep. does biomechanics. Um, a lot of sensor research, uh, looking into like IMUs and talk about those. Um, but yeah, is there anything else? That's it, dude. No. Yeah, definitely don't ask him if there's anything yeah. else, dude. <laughs> okay. Anyways, back to uh, <laughs> we got Anthony Brady over here, uh, known as Baseball Freak Nine. His burner account can be found at Hockey Freak underscore Nine. Two time Tommy John survivor. Yes. I mean, let's not let's not cap it at two times. I I, I feel like a, a, a fucking triple is coming up. Oh, oh yeah, the, yeah. the, the three beat the three beats coming up for yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyways, he runs a time. motion capture lab. Um, developed the edge visies, all the visuals of the spin axis, all that kind of stuff. Uh, self taught coder. Um, just all around self taught bad coder. Very bad coder. I mean, I don't know. You got a couple of videos out on uh, p- good and bad coding practices. Bad coding practices, yeah, yeah, yeah. exclusively bad coding. But anyways, practices. this guy will run. If you ever hire a driver out for a mobile assessment, whether it's in Japan or some random state, this guy that you probably meet this guy. Um, also, also low key, like still throws gas, sidearm, low nineties. Got a kick and squat, can squat a lot. Got a bubble butt, uh, and that pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anymore. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say like first and foremost, hockey player. Is yeah, how yeah, I'd like yeah. to be described yeah. in the future. Yeah. So let's start there. Definitely. Big game tomorrow. So. Oh, you're gonna play? Back on the ice, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And snowboarding since, the same day. Since the knee injury. Oh yeah, gonna go. With yeah, with two with, pending injuries too. Yeah, I gotta go snowboard tomorrow. For sure. We'll be good. This we'll is be. Alex Caravan. Yeah, Alex, analyst. Alex Caravan. Uh, that is. Alex is not short for anything. It's not short for Alexander. It's just Alex. Also doesn't have a middle There's name. There's also no middle name. Um, English third language. Um, <laughs> Romanian first. And uh, data analytics second. So quantitative analyst. You better write down my grade. Resident stats guy. <laughs> uh, resident stats guy. Uh, termed Romanian supercomputer. Uh, does all of the powering of like our analytics in R and D. Um, also, bunk bed mate. Uh, sometimes bottom bunk. Sometimes, so, oh, sometimes, sometimes I say like a bed mate. Some, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes bottom bottom bunk. Sometimes top bunk. Uh, I mean bed mate when we were in Thailand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Do what you had to do, right? Uh, and yeah. we paid a pretty price for that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Alex and I... Traveler sickness is contagious. <laughs> Alex and I live together, uh, not just in the same house, in the same room. We have bunk beds, so the data never mm-hmm. sleeps with us. Uh, we're just like, we work all night long. Um, Lindley, Lindley doesn't quite live up here. He, he lives a little south, but... 
but yeah, that's uh, that's basically who we are. Unless you got any other anything that we missed about you. I mean, a couple things, but we'll keep it off there. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's probably probably <laughs> best best to do that. Um, so yeah, so this is just a podcast, um, kind of about like everything or, or at least to touch on kind of some of the stuff that we do uh in r d um we're kind of like r d at driveline is always churning we're always doing something but a lot of times that doesn't get out there and so hopefully this podcast can like serve as just like you know 40 minutes an hour whatever it is each week into like what do you guys even do kind of a thing and like uh, like recently too yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. and just like just like insights into like what we do within like especially because the the landscape of baseball has changed so much in the last couple years in the last like you know uh year alone it's just like technology alone dude the astros the last day alone yeah yeah so like everything that's going on uh within baseball uh i think that like we get trapped at or like we get sucked into like the driveline bubble with where we work of like assuming that like oh everyone knows these things and these are like common knowledge of like uh what is spin efficiency like how is it calculated <clears throat> what are the kind of like things that go into that and you can dm me, DM me for a formula i will give it to you <laughs> then will be five dollars maybe right. mm, two dollars if you, you have a cute profile picture <laughs> but just like the nuances and limitations of like technology and data and baseball and all of those things and how we kind of like interact with it. We assume a lot of times that like the average coach out there, the average watcher of baseball just like kind of knows those things, right? Because we just get like sucked into the drive on bubble. So this is just like, uh, yeah, like a look at like, you know, uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes a week of just like hanging out, talking to us, kind of like our day-to-day conversations that we have about where we think baseball is going, um, what we're doing within baseball, those kind of things. You know, I think a relevant topic we could talk about right off the bat and something uh, Anthony and I just went to last week is ABCA. It was my first ABCA. I think Anthony's second or third. Uh, just second. Yeah. Second. Okay. Um, but yeah, I know we, it's interesting because. What does ABCA stand for? I actually just recently learned that. It's like American, American baseball, baseball Coaches, Coaches Association. Association. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that's too easy of an answer. So yeah. if that's not what it is, we'll strike that. We'll strike that from the tape. It could, it could not be the answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think it's really interesting because there's so much variety of the people that were there and the vendors and the people that are hawking stuff. And we got a yeah, this are uh, this, someone has wandered in our house. We'll ask them for rent money later. But anyways, uh, <laughs> no, I, I think ABC is really interesting from the perspective of being able to like have your finger on the pulse of what's going on and like what people are actually getting interest. So we have a couple like big technologies at ABC. We were next to like Blast and Rap Soto, which are two technologies we obviously work a bunch with and um, have like, you know, grown leaps and bounds in the last couple of years while we've been working with them. So it's kind of nuts to see. And then a bunch of like, you know, smaller vendors trying to like either be this, that second wave, wave of technology or like kind of strike out on their own. Mm-hmm. And then people that are doing like moral school stuff, you know, selling physical products or, trying to market like, you know, video, uh, dirt, like rings, you know what I mean? It's just like a, it's crazy, it's a crazy variety. Yeah. Well, like the, like, like Turfus and like the yeah. dirt and like clay companies, like those are always going to exist because it's yeah, just like a right. part of baseball. But what's like changed in the last couple of years is just like the, just like oversaturation of like baseball technology companies, right? right? Like everyone now has like a tool or a piece of like technology that like applied to the game is supposed to help with like player development or performance or something like a, a wearable a camera some sort of like technology solution to like help players like get better it used to be just yeah. a radar gun now it's like all of these other fields and i think a really good first question to actually kyle can weigh in on as well even though he wasn't at abca is when like a new technology comes out and we're looking at it like what do we look for and what like sways us towards it being a you know something worth partnering with something worth investigating so and i know you've messed around with a couple of like sensor technologies and everything what was like what are the first couple of preliminary steps you take uh i think right off the bat like trying to do some sort of validation to make sure it's decent data and then also like we've uh recently put together like some partnerships and whatnot we're like trying to figure out uh how we can work with technologies and products that we have like they just integrate better with our program mm-hmm. and we like have access to uh it's like more data better data um just like 
I don't know, being like ease of use and being able to like use the product uh, seamlessly is really important as well. Do you want to go into what validation means? Because I think um, I think most people might not have the same idea or might not be as stringent as we are. Uh, yeah, I think validation just like to me means like making sure something's either accurate or just like consistently inaccurate. So if something is uh, even if something can't uh, always hold up to the gold standard, like if a sensor can't match the data from this other technology that's way more expensive that other people have been using for years, mm -hmm. then like that's okay as long as um, it can be consistent enough and then we can find that it does measure some something that we want to like track um, or something that does matter. Yeah. And then as long as that it does that consistently, then we can use it and we can provide value. And what do you mean by consistent and accurate? Uh, so accurate, I'm referring to like is it if, correct? Yeah, if it's a correct like number. So if we're measuring this one thing and we have this like established technology or established product that is measuring it and it gives us this value or this measurement and we have this other thing that we're trying to figure out if it's worth anything, um, if it is the same value as what this standard is measuring, then I would consider that accurate. Um, and if it's consistently uh, around that, the same measurement as the established one, then that would consider that accurate. And then uh, consistent would be just like, even if it's not the same value, mm -hmm. if it's off by X. Set, same set amount. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So yeah. like if I, if I weigh 215 pounds and a scale weighs me in at 215 pounds, it's, you like, really, it's accurate. Yeah, you, that's definitely not under, I mean, I do, <laughs> I do weigh 215 pounds. Like maybe, maybe when? not today. Two years ago? No, no, no. I mean like- what? That, you know, maybe a month ago before the weekend. That's pretty interesting. What's the uh, what's the standard for weight? Like, how would you validate a scale? Well, that's good. I mean, I feel like there's some like really, really like scientific way that's been like uh, engineered or something. Okay. I don't know. Some sort of like okay. proven methodology. Right. Well, that's, that's interesting. God, just like, because if what even is the gold standard of like weight? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah, true. That's true. But like if the scale read me as like. 230 which yeah, is just which like is probably completely accurate. false <laughs> completely false right but it consistently measured me at 230 like yeah. that is it's a reliable scale yeah. you just need to understand the offset, like, the offset yeah. of that right like it maybe not maybe is not accurate it's like with the radar guns right if there's a other radar gun company out there that measures ball velocity next to a stalker like always plus three plus four it's like at least reliable but maybe not accurate right and so i think as far as like that trade-off goes, like I think in the baseball tech space, reliability is more important than accuracy. Right. Uh, you know, like I would take a radar gun that consistently measures three miles an hour faster and the knowledge of that, as opposed to a radar gun that is like within five to seven miles of accuracy or of reliability, like a lot of variance between like what it reads, but more accurate, right? Yeah. Like I think that is uh, less useful. Like I think like reliability is, is way more important than accuracy. I think I'm definitely Baseball fishing. specifically. Yeah, well, well I was gonna say definitely fishing with our own methodology of assessing and retesting people. Yeah, exactly. If, if we, yeah, we don't, we don't, we also don't care what the initial numbers are because right, we're comparing right. like intra, like mm -hmm. between athletes or sorry, within athletes. So if someone, someone's initial bat speed is 70 miles an hour and the real truth is like you know 67 who cares if we're just like measuring a base about 70 and we right, okay right, now right, it's 72 yeah. okay so it went up two miles an hour that's right. what we care about yeah, we don't yeah. care so much about it being either 72 or 69 we just care yeah. about that person gained bat speed exactly yeah it's like it can be wrong as long as it's consistently wrong yeah. like that yeah. that that's fine right yeah. because at least you have a reliable way to measure something at like the beginning and the end and, and compare those back and forth if it's uh accurate but it's not reliable then yeah. you're just like you're wasting your time you know you're or you need to have a large enough sample size to kind of like uh overact that or uh counteract that but i think like beyond validity and like reliability i think understanding the limitations is more right. important with the tech like that it, it, like every booth that we went to and like person that i talked to at abca like that was my main question is like you need to know what the product can't do. Yeah. Because if you don't, then you're like using it and you're just like assuming these things and you have inferences of like what it is measuring or what you think it's measuring. And then you can just be led down like rabbit holes that are useless and make all these like kind of like hypotheses and theories that are just like wrong. So right. I, I think like knowing the limitations of a product is more important than knowing like what it can do. Like know what it can't do. 
that's where you need to get to. And, and kind of along those lines, what do you guys think is the like? Because we had a lot of people come up to our booth who maybe didn't know exactly what Dreadline did, but knew about us from a reputation point of view. Knew about us like from oh okay, like people I respect use Driveline, and I'm trying to get into Driveline. Yeah. What What are your thoughts on kind of like the segmentation of coaches who are just now starting to get, get in technology? And other ones who are like have been there for a while. Like, what was kind of like the learning curve when it comes to that? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the biggest things about like stressing the importance of like understanding limitations too. Because like all of these new coaches who are like maybe older, don't have like a background in like science or research or any of that, they're just coming in and they're like, okay, well, I gotta like catch up to the curve. Like, I gotta I gotta ride this wave yeah. that everyone else is on, or like yeah. or like hop on at the end, and they're just like going into things and that they'll get like a piece of technology like a Soto, whatever it is and they'll take the data up front for what it is right and they don't understand like any of the limitations beyond uh, and then they're just like you know they could be led astray right if they right. don't know kind of like the process and like underlying things behind it or at least just have an idea like there's they, so many nuances to it they can also get like discouraged too exactly right <laughs> you know like there's that whole yeah i think it's like it could be like a huge issue, especially because then you have this new coach who's like motivated, aspiring to like get with yeah. it and like be a part of this like tech revolution. And then they have like a bad experience with like, oh, right. well, this thing was saying this and I like yeah. trusted it and I believed it. And it's like, well, there's like, it's more complicated than that. Right? There's definitely a learning curve too. Like you have to make sure like technology are calibrated too. Cause sometimes yeah. like teams will have track mans installed and then they won't be calibrated. So all the runnings or all the readings will be off. Um, and yeah, understanding the differences. Cause I, I know I was, I was personally pitching a new potential tool based off trackman data and like, you know, there are plenty of coaches that were interested, but they want to make sure like, they want to know if it like worked off wrap sort of data yeah. and it's like understanding even like wrap and trackman two pretty popular technologies, but they have like different metrics and also like different ways to track it. Like, mm -hmm. ra like Doppler radar versus like optical. Um, you know, like quick differences. Rap Soto has like spin efficiency, like top, top spin, side spin, Yeah, even spin, just like metrics spin. and naming. Yeah, metrics. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's operational it's like, definitions of like, it's like very important. metric. Yeah, it's almost like, it's like so I think it would metric. almost benefit a coach like just having a quick like screenshot of like what an output looks like from Rap Soto, mm -hmm. what an output looks like from Trackman mm -hmm. and then piecing that together. How yeah. do you think, how do you think that can be done easier? Like, what are the steps we have to take to, like, to, like if somebody Just has standard. this technology yeah. and has, yeah. like, so, like, for on, along the lines of Rapsodo and TrackMan, like, if one school uses this and one school uses this and they want to try to, like, compare to other data, like, are, are there resources and, like, what are the things that they can do to, like, try to compare? You're saying compare their TrackMan to their Rapsodo? Or yeah, their... to, like, basically make, like, they got, they just collected this data and they want to make a decision on it based off of like what they've seen with like from uh, what other people are doing like are there steps yeah. they have to take to make sure that i mean i mean there really isn't much like uh there's there really isn't much like, resources go yeah yeah like especially not within like the technologies like it's not like you can just like tap into rapsodo and change like track man it's like we, yeah. we have to do that yeah. on our own right like, that's like literally what we've had to do yeah you know yeah uh, there aren't like available resources to kind of do that thing it's it just like a lack of like standardization yeah. Yeah. Uh, across the sport because it's like to be fair it's a completely new field like there's yeah. all these new technologies like of course that's going to happen you yeah know? like there just needs to be like i don't know some like governing body or just us yeah be like okay we're going to call it spin axis yeah not tilt not direction yeah. and it's going to be measured like this right not right. like 180 at the top you know or 180 at the bottom or like whatever it is right just like make a decision and like call it that and then have the whole field go that way because all these companies are just building technology and there's nothing out there that says like follow this formatting or like standardized like guideline it's just yeah. like this is what we measure and that is a, an important gap that like i think we're lucky to have been filling up and will continue to fill kind of like pairing technology together and seeing the relationship on those metrics because I, I mean i personally have done a lot of work on pairing blast and hit tracks and hit tracks measures like batted ball metrics so like, you know, EV, launch angle, uh, distance, like what, what direction was the ball hit in, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And bla blast measures like bat, uh, like bat, like uh, metrics, you know, mm -hmm. bat speed. Like bat physics. Yeah, yeah, attack angle, that kind of stuff. And then have an idea of like, okay, how do the bat metrics correlate to on-field performance? Mm -hmm. um, and then the same thing with Raps on Trackman, which is why I think we feel confident in having now, like I think live to, as, as of... Uh, whatever the first second weekend of january 2020 we have like trackman csv incorporations for 
all our like edge visits that we built off rap data. Yeah, yeah. So we now have the idea we, we you can you can import trackman data and mm-hmm. then we will generate um you know visualizations on the spin axis yeah bait that was initially based on off rap sort of data and yeah. i think that's like you know again speaks to our ability to integrate the data which yeah. you know some people might not yeah, so a lot of people won't have but like i think that we are like you know hard at work trying to make that universal for people to pop yeah. in yeah i think it's it's even crazy too because like e- even at abca yeah. when we talk to the people with like pitch logic like now yeah. there's even a third way yeah to right, measure right, right. like yeah a, a, a ball ton, physics, ton, ton of smaller you points. know yeah, yeah. like it, 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 could ju- it just keeps going like so uh consistently there's like yeah. so many different ways to do it i think that's like m- one of the biggest frustrations in like uh, the biomechanics community, like mm-hmm. baseball specifically, is just like, you know, you you can't compare between models or labs or like marker sets and like the way that like angles are defined. I mean, like I literally spent yeah. all weekend last weekend trying to like figure out like reference segments and like mm-hmm. like joint angle stuff. And I just like went down the biggest rabbit hole of deciding like is hip shoulder separation calculated from like the torso in reference to the pelvis or the pelvis yeah. in reference to the torso, right? And there's no like standardization. And so there just needs to be like, I don't know. So someone needs to just make a decision and everyone needs to follow that. I feel like that might be a, a pretty good like thing to talk about. Uh, just like how like joint angles are calculated or like how certain kinematics are just calculated in general. Like, I don't know if you yeah. want to. Well, I, I think that's just like a good example of like understanding the limitations or like nuances yeah. of it, right? So like uh, Dean, Dean Jackson, uh, shout out online. Shout out. You power. throwing hard yet, Dean? <laughs> online, online pitching manager. First, first man uh, 90. Uh, yeah, yeah. Online pitching uh, coach. He, he had 90? Mm, off the mound. Pull, pull down? Ex- no. <laughs> <laughs> pull down three ounce? <laughs> Dean, uh, Dean was asking about um, like hip shoulder separation on a biomechanics report and like its relation to like torso angular velocity and pelvis angular velocity and like how they were changing and like in his eyes when he was like looking at it because like he, you know he understands biomechanics really well but like doesn't necessarily understand some of the limitations and like nuances of it and got like sucked down a rabbit hole and also got confused on like how things were being calculated which also drug me down it to try and figure out like if there was anything wrong with I our see. reports right <laughs> like as i almost like did which they are fine but even something as simple as like understanding that you know the order in which you calculate a joint angle right like um the issue is like if i calculate hip shoulder separation by the torso in reference to the pelvis along like the z-axis like for rotational stuff i get a very different number if i do the pelvis in reference to the to the torso so if you just like flip those you get a completely different measurement kind of a thing right right? because it's like all about your frame of reference and like local coordinate systems you're comparing orientations like in space between two objects that are like not really connected as far as like the you know i mean they are but not as far as like the biomechanics model goes right so that's an example of like a limitation of the biomechanics report or like a nuance like an underlying thing that exists to where as a coach uh or, or like someone who's like applying it you kind of need to know that right so like uh you need to have the complex understanding of like all of these things but then you need to be able to filter it out into the simple okay if you just stay like simple throughout if you have like a simple understanding of it you don't really understand the nuances or like all of that stuff um you could be potentially like filtering out and like coaching like bad information do, do right? you think it'd be worth it i mean i don't want to like get, i mean you know it's supposed to be technical technical like i don't want to get like too sucked down it but do you guys think you could pitch a like six second breakdown of how to calculate joint angles yeah i mean they're just like uh 60 seconds is probably an hour because like <laughs> I went to school for it for two years and I still just spent a whole weekend yeah, trying to like right, relearn right, right. it. But it's basically just like uh, comparing like a segment in space to another, right? Like yeah. so, so like elbow flexion is really easy. Yep. Like you just take the angle of the forearm relative to uh, right. the upper arm, right? In like yep. space. And you're just like measuring this angle, right? But there's also, there's the three dimensions, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's That's another nice. angle yeah. and then there's like rotation angles, right. right? So for hip shoulder separation, we're just looking at like rotation angles of the torso uh, and the pelvis, right? right? But it gets really hard when like, 
you know, the arm can't do it, but like if my pelvis shifts like anteriorly and like tilts laterally, that affects the way that it's like rotated, right? right? And how you measure that angle. So like that's when comparing those orientations gets like really, really tough. And like that's one of the nuances and like limitations of biomechanics and how you decide. And then there's like a whole area on like carbon sequences and like Euler rotations, right? Like if you have an object and you apply an XYZ rotation, that's very different than a ZYX, right? And that's like a whole nother area that like conceptually, I think it's one of the hardest things for like anyone in biomechanics to understand because in mathematics, you learn so much in like two dimensions. And now you take this like two dimensional learning and try to apply it to like three dimensional space of two local like coordinate systems that exist in a global coordinate system like reference frame and it's just like it, like i get lost in it like all the time mm -hmm. right yeah. and so like to expect or like you know uh like a coach or a player or anything to like even understand that is absurd so i think it's a lot easier to just like explain to them that hey there are some limitations to this in like a filterable way and so like making that known is important and i was gonna, I was gonna ask you lindley uh based off you know i know you've been messing around with like a couple of technologies like uh notch uh apdm sensors um maybe a couple others like have you noticed any you know any anything that is harder to replicate in a technology as opposed to our own like motion capture lab like what, what what's like what's like what are like key things you kind of like okay i noticed technologies keep coming up short on this um it's tough uh i think it's like so sensor if we're measuring like doing motion capture with sensors we have that same problem but like also this other problem of not getting super great data because they're dude really are you talking about me hitting again come on man no. i told you we're gonna keep this off there <laughs> No, just like how sensors make uh, take like movement measurements is not as accurate um, as the way that we do it with our optical motion capture lab. Mm -hmm. So there, it's like it's tough because we have the same problems. What, what do you mean by what do you mean by sensor? So like, what's uh, sampling rate? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is a sensor? Uh, a sensor just senses something. In our case, it senses we have like a set of nine sensors that they combine all, all their data and it just measures movement like uh um, like like kvs blast those yep, things. yeah like uh yeah and so if you use those sensors in a certain way you can get data that is kind of comparable to uh, an optical motion capture lab but mm -hmm. we end up running into things like um if the if the measurement we're actually making falls up short and that's not accurate then how can the joint angle measurement like anthony was just talking about how can that be accurate when we don't even accurately know the angle or the orientation of the segments we're trying to make the angle with, joint angle yeah. with, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, it's really tough. And I think that's like another thing that like we run into that's like good to take a step back from uh, that we're just like, we go so hard on like gold standard level data quality because like we want really robust data and like really accurate to be able to do what we're doing, which is like high level research at like, like, you know, really high fidelity and like large data sets. But baseball isn't like done that way. And that doesn't ever like scale to like something that a consumer can just use. Yeah. So like, these sensor-based solutions that are just like affordable, like a diamond kinetic sensor, like blast sensor, or like, you know, um, KVS or 4D, like whatever it is, like that is just like, you know, potentially a high school or like college right, coach can right. afford that. They right. can't afford a like, you know, $100,000 biomechanics lab that's like gold standard and like all the expertise that goes right. into that, right? So like, you, you kind of just have to like uh, step back. I think that like Jagers talks about this a lot of like the simple complex simple like curve you know like you have to like start simple understand the complex and then go back to simple like he That's explains why. it no, well no he explains it from the like lens of like because i started out just like looking at like very simple data of like let's just say like on the pitch design aspect right, right? of just like watching a pitch move as it like throws my hand like that's very simple and then i went to the complex of like high speed edgertronic right because i've like consumed like thousands of clips of thousand frames per second edgertronic footage like he thinks that now at this point in time like going now to like a more simple area of just like he thinks he can get a lot of value out of like 
a slow motion on an iPhone, right? right? Like 120 or 240 frames per second. But he can only get like value out of that because of like all of like the complex understanding and, and that like, you know, consumption that he's had, right? So like us... If we can understand what's going on biomechanically in the pitching motion at like a very complex level at 240 frames per second within a millimeter of accuracy in the biomechanics lab, then we can now like shift that into like a more affordable, simple solution of like, you know, an IMU sensor system or even like cameras, right? Like some sort of like optical, like markerless uh, solution. And then you can like learn from that, right? Like I think that biomechanically, I can understand a lot just from like a slow motion side video from all of the understanding of like complex biomechanics uh, data that we have. But I couldn't do that if I didn't have that like that like peak in the middle of like all the complex stuff, you know. So like uh, understanding that allows you then to do more with the simple, which is ultimately just like easier for everyone and like scales way better to like getting it into everyone's hands. And we're talking about Eric Jagers, uh, king of the Turkish get-ups, in case it's not, in case it wasn't clear. <laughs> Eric Jagers, uh, Cincinnati Reds, uh, you know. Pitch is an extraordinaire. Uh, assistant think pitching coordinator. Currently still single. So yeah, yeah. just yeah. leaving that out there. Yep. Kevin, uh, on, so like for those technologies that aren't gold standard, talking about how like they can still be of value. What are some, from like your stats background, working with the, those, that data a lot, like what are some steps that need to be taken to make sure that like, even though the uh, measurement quality or the accuracy might not be that great, like what are some things that you can do to like still uh, get the value out of it at, for like at the team level or like for a, like what are the, some of the things you, you have like worked on for like organizations or like right. individual players? Uh, I think some of it you covered um, with the reliability focus. I'll, I'll, I'll say like in general, I think one of the things that's really important when taking into account like a large like swath of data, so to speak, is, and I think like people kind of like, in this case like drilled in early on in a quantitative <laughs> background, but kind of like people forget about it, is looking at outliers as well. Because mm-hmm. uh, I mean, myself and Daniel Coyne have like messed around of creating models on, you know, it's got a new Bumble connection. Let's go, baby. <laughs> Always uh, working. Always working. I've messed around with like, uh, you know, we'll build like models of judging people like, you know, uh, a pitcher's like arsenal score, like basically a quantitative measure of how strong a repertoire is of a pitcher. And this stuff breaks all the time when you look at like certain outliers, you know, like it'll it'll break on a low, low 60s or high 60s, like change up. Uh, low 70s curveball mm-hmm. just because those are such like bizarre pitches yeah. so then they'll be like okay those pitches like are on the scale here and then like you know there'll be like, a couple pitchers you know doing that and then we'll take findings away from that and then apply like okay like well it looks like a low mm-hmm. 70s curveball is yeah. really fire because yeah. the one guy who threw it like got like two swinging strikes out of the three batters yeah. he faced so, so i think i think that also applies to technology where uh like you know if, if data is if there are a couple data points that you know seem out of the ordinary and skew overall findings we first have to filter for those and then like what would i what i like to do usually is i think there's two basic steps towards like analyzing you know specifically technology data but also like the idea of pairing technology with like some other metric right we have technology findings on a player or a group of players and then we have like an idea of their talent level mm-hmm. so i think the two, i think the two like low-hanging fruit things they can do is correlational analysis and then like segmented bucket analysis. So by correlational analysis, I think it's like the most common thing people usually do. And sometimes they, they kind of uh, air a little bit by being too over eager, yeah. but they'll just take, let's say fast speed and blast and then like exit velocity and hit yeah. tracks. So they'll grab, you know, we have two, let's say we have 200 recorded pairs of blast data and hit tracks data. So let's grab all the bass speed and all the exit velocity and just do correlation. Okay, so two two quick things on this. One, that is heavily biased by how what kind of players were in that sample. Is it one guy that had 190 swings, and then you know 10 others that had each a swing like that? That's an that's that's a would be a pretty insane like uh, setup. But either way, the point is, in that case, like the correlational analysis, it's a base it's basically one guy's data is overwhelming to everyone else. So you could like in that case, you could have like hitter averages rather than overall average, but also like 
the correlations well, correlations are based on like a linear relationship by mm -hmm. default. So you're like assuming, maybe right yeah you're assuming a linear you're assuming a linear relationship where in, in some cases maybe it'll be you assume like this. every increment if, is equal right, to each right 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 if if the real relationship is like something like this mm -hmm. which is an odd one but let's say it is that then a linear uh uh fitted line is gonna completely misrepresent the type of data exactly yeah so so other other things we do or other like the second which brings me to my second point uh a bucketed analysis where maybe we lump in like certain rather than looking at the continuous data like okay like you know. Well, 63.1, 63.2, we lump in um, metrics based on like buckets that make sense based on the distribution of data. Like, okay, we'll have 66.5, 65, 68, 68, 71, 71, 74, so on. And then look at like metrics in those groups and then mm -hmm. seeing if that tells us something about the story. Yeah. So so I, th I think that's one way to kind of like right off the bat, like when I've taken like a new technology, look for outliers and then run both like low hanging fruits of uh, correlational analysis and then bucket segmented analysis. Yeah, yeah. I think I think another big one is like, uh, and you you touched on a bit of like like sample size yeah. just in general. Yeah. But like, I think especially. Damn, bro! I didn't get a I didn't get a drop sample size. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for you to. Yeah, the last thing I, I was waiting that. for you to. But I think that's like one sample. The, one of the biggest things that like. Uh, coaches and like people yeah. should understand right, right, right. with all of the technologies out there and like especially to talk about like recent stuff that was my biggest frustration at like um like going to like pitchapalooza and like listening oh, yeah. to some of the talks oh yeah is like when you have these technologies you, you need to have like if, if you're trying to like run your own experiments <laughs> and like tests of like interventions or whatever it is like it shouldn't be a one-to-one -one right, right it shouldn't be like one trial, do this thing, another trial and check the measurements because there's a lot of like what we talked about early, like a lot of these products might have a lot of variance and like variability uh, between like whether it's like swing to swing or like pitch to pitch, right? Yeah. Like you need a large enough sample size to kind of like find the underlying thing, right? Like things like Blast, um, I actually don't know about hit tracks that much, but like uh, I know that Blast can have like a lot of variability to right. swing, right? right? So it's not Enough like you would want to do one swing, say like, oh, he swung 72. Yeah. Do something else. Next one is like 68, yeah. right? That four mile an hour difference could be enough that it's just variability. Yeah. Like the swing could be the same. Right. It could just be like instrument measurement error at that point, right? Yeah. So for each thing, when you're trying to do something like that, like I think for coaches, the specific application is like start looking at session averages not just like one swing compared to right, another right. or like one peak compared to another peak, yeah. right? It's like averages over a week compared to another week or like a session to session, right? And one quick anecdote I was going to say on, uh, and you guys will know who I'm talking about if I drop the uh, snot nose reference, <laughs> but uh, one one fairly well-known uh, coach slash like the business owner out there, I think had a criticism of one of my blogs on pairing Blast and Hitchrex data. It was actually one of the more, you know, conv statistically convincing uh, cases where I, I compared batter's average bat speed to batter's average like EV. And it was like a quite a high correlation. I forget what it was exactly, like maybe 0.8 something. And I posted a table of all the raw data because mm -hmm. I think one of the most annoying things when, you know, discussing stuff over the internet, you know, you, someone will say something and be like, oh, okay, yeah. well, let me see the data. And then, and, then, and then, yeah, and then I'll just like deflect and say something else. It's like, okay, let me see the data. So I posted a data table of, the, the batter averages, and I remember like, it was like a, you know, it was a table of like maybe 50 hitters, mm -hmm. all their averages. So it's like, you know, 50 hitters who each had like at least like 15 swings, something like that, right? So I feel confident in those numbers being representative yeah. of their actual average. Large enough sample size. And like, like I said, it's quite a very high correlation, maybe 0.87. And then the guy goes, the, the first hitter on the table uh, had a like pretty high bat speed and like a lower EV. And he goes, well, what about this guy? It's like, my man, that's one out of fifty. <laughs> yeah. That's literally that's literally the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the 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 like the second worst example could have picked. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's that's just like, fine. yeah, like yeah. what about him? What about the other forty nine guys? That's, li yeah. that's literally the yeah. Greg Maddox argument. Yeah, right. Yeah, like that's yeah. literally the yeah. like. Well, Greg yeah. Maddox didn't need, yeah. need velocity. It's yeah. like, bro, like yeah. average fastball velocity is still going up. Yeah. Like yeah. you know, like yeah. you can't just like continue yeah. to just like look at one yeah. thing but oh and this guy's grammatics okay yeah, yeah, yeah. No. exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah never mind that he's chilling yeah, yeah yeah it's like okay well it like if you want to base your entire like 
development philosophy depending on like exceptions yeah. one outlier one exception like yeah. go ahead you know yeah not to mention Maddox also threw like quite hard in his prime yeah but and yeah. even beyond that yeah. it's just it's like just... that's a great example of how like you can just you can just stay simple like yeah. in like today's day and age like within baseball and stuff like there's so much competition for like you need to be louder and you need to be nuanced. And that's how you like grow within this like market of like technology and all this stuff. And like, that's my biggest thing that I've been saying to like coaches and people that I talked to at ABCA was just like, you don't need to go out and like buy the nicest sensors or like nicest pieces of technology or data or something. It's like, if you're working with like mostly high school kids and like low level baseball players, just like get a, get something that measures like a, you know, bat speed, and like a radar gun and yeah. like that's it and like yeah. get them in the weight room you know like it do really really well at like the simple stuff that actually like scales into performance right and yeah. like the things that we know is just like velocity matters from like a pitching perspective and like bat speed matters right like all of the other metrics and things that are measured like but, but you need to spin access yeah. like, I mean, like yeah. just like yeah. be like you can just like stay simple and just like do that and I, it is crazy though that there was like pushback on like something like bat speed yeah like hitting is in the the like argument era of like pitching in you know 2014 <laughs> like, yeah still battling over like yeah swinging the bat fast is good you know yeah it's like ridiculous and I think for that specifically not, not to harp too much more on it but just the idea that like regardless of what 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 velo they sit at or what velo they like commonly swing at like the idea of someone increasing their pitch velo and their like peak bass speed is like good yeah it's like you know what i mean it's like <laughs> dude how can you not yeah, how yeah. can you not not realize that's like a yeah. a improvement yeah. overall Regardless like having an ability to do that yeah and beyond that from like a non-baseball perspective like I, for some reason, whenever something like that happens, like I always just imagine these people in like an academic environment, yeah. you know, like at like a conference, you know, like someone presents like a huge research paper of like this giant robust data set and like all these findings and stuff. And someone just afterward like raises their hand and like points to an outlier and is like, well, what about that guy? Yeah. You know, like just pointing at like one thing, like yeah. that person would get like obliterated in the yeah. scientific community, you know, yeah. like, because everyone there is just like understands it's like okay yeah we have like we create large data sets we analyze them right and like we 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 understand what outliers are right and we don't like base all our findings off those or we don't let them skew them right but in the baseball community they're just like isn't quite that level of understanding so like people that do that just like get away with it right and they're just like they can run with that it's like fine <clears throat> But yeah, that's, that's our uh, quick dabble on some technologies and drawbacks, pros to them, how to interpret them. Um, next episode, we're going to talk about Lin- Lindley's love life. So definitely tune in for that. <laughs> yeah. And who has, who has best who has best on what? <laughs> yeah, currently, currently in a long distance relationship. It's pretty exciting. Uh, pretty, yeah. What are you, what, dude, she's going to see this episode. Be a little bit more positive about it, dog. No, it's just not as, like, exciting and interesting as as uh, some other people's situations. Yeah, we, we got that. We recorded that on the cold about. open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're releasing those minutes, right? Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that, that's a Patreon episode. We got to make a Patreon episode yeah, where yeah. we just talk about our own yeah. personal stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, separate one. Or yeah. plus video. Yeah, yeah, plus yeah. Video. yeah. <laughs> plus video is just all our personal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pay for this. Yeah, yeah. Put the paywall up. But anyways, um, gotta gotta check out who maps with me on Bumble. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep this first episode pretty short and sweet. Um, uh, yeah, we're about to head out to Matador Nachos. Shout out happy hour after ten p.m. Mm-hmm. and stay posted for more nuanced, um, very persuasive uh, looks at technology and baseball. Yeah, just kind of like a just like a yeah. round table of yeah. like what we talk about. Uh, in R&D I don't know just like some insights to like living in the you know baseball world yeah. with, with research and tech right now and things will definitely eventually get more raunchy <laughs> <laughs> they will not <laughs> they will they will not just cut, cut it out right before I say raunchy <laughs> yeah. just so it's not it's not it's not quite certain what the adjective is